7174. Uh, uh, you ready, Art? Yep, we're ready here. Okay, uh, 7175, instrumentation ready, Woody? Stand ready to go. Uh, 7180, uh, you ready on top, Mud Eye? Everything's set up here. Okay, let's uh, give it uh, back to Gamble and the O&M boys and uh, see how she operates. 6 1, this is 6 0. Oh. I'd like you to open the left spillway gates to 20,000 cubic feet per second. Coming to 20,000. from the summit lands of the Rockies, the Colorado River responds to annual snowfalls with erratic flows. During the snowmelt period of April through July, it can roar through the canyons in a gigantic flood, or it can flow quietly and quickly fall back after the snow is gone. During each of the past 80 years or so, the Colorado has been measured and averages have been obtained. But the river cares not for averages and seems rather to follow its own mysterious destiny. In the fall of 1982 and the early spring of 1983, snow depths in the high mountains of Colorado, Wyoming, and Utah were only a little above average. In May, however, heavy snowstorms hit the high country. It was cold then, but the heat of summer cut like a hot knife and the heavy snow melt was on. First indication of flooding occurred just west of the Colorado River Basin along Utah's Wasatch Mountains. Here the streams peaked quickly and filled Utah Lake to overflowing. The runoff cut through the city streets of Bountiful and Farmington, Utah. While in Salt Lake City, the water was channeled out onto some of the principal streets to form man-made rivers a fascinating diversion for office workers and tourists. In the Colorado River Basin itself, heavy flows came from mountains in five states. From Wyoming's lofty Wind River Mountains, the runoff rushed through Fontenelle Dam and onto Flaming Gorge Dam, where it overflowed the lake and plunged into the spillway and bypass tubes. In western Colorado, heavy releases from Blue Mesa Dam flowed into Morrow Point Lake, which then spilled in a dramatic 350-foot drop. Crystal Reservoir also poured over its spillway in another dramatic freefall. And from the Uinta Mountains of Utah, flowed several streams and rivers. And all of these tributaries combined. From the Strawberry and the Duchesne, from the Green and the Big Sandy, from the Yampa, the White and the Eagle, from the Tomichi and the Gunnison, from the Dolores and the San Juan, from the Colorado. Every stream and every river poured into Lake Powell where the combined waters rose rapidly toward the spillways at Glen Canyon Dam. Efforts were made to control this unanticipated rise of Lake Powell by operating the power plant at full capacity, 
thus releasing 28,000 cubic feet per second of water. But it was not enough, as inflow into Lake Powell rose quickly to over 90,000 cubic feet per second in early June, and the left spillway gates had to be opened. It was understood that these spillways would probably suffer some erosion by a physical process called cavitation. Cavitation occurs when high velocity flows are thrown upward by some small obstruction. This causes a partial vacuum, which produces vapor cavities in the water. These unstable cavities then collapse, sending intense shock waves against the concrete. At first, small pieces, then larger pieces of concrete are literally pounded out. After one hole has formed, a leapfrog action tends to promote the start of another, on down through the tunnel in stair-step fashion. It was realized, too, that most of the damage would probably occur at the elbow section, where the spillway levels out. After only four days' operation, inspectors found that cavitation had indeed been active at Glen Canyon. A photo taken by one of the inspectors disclosed holes in the concrete lining 20 feet wide and up to four feet deep. The spillways would have to be used, but the left one would carry most of the excess flow, thus preserving the right spillway for any future need. To reduce spillway use, wooden plywood flashboards four feet high were added to the spillway gates and the outlet tubes were open to bypass an additional 17,000 cubic feet per second of water. Although engineers had no way to see into operating spillways, they could tell what was happening by the action of the water emerging from the lower portal flip bucket. On June 19th, the left spillway stopped sweeping, indicating that erosion by cavitation was damaging the concrete tunnel lining. The flow was raised from 12,000 to 17,000 cubic feet per second, and the sweep resumed. But on June 28th, the sweeping again ceased. When the flow was raised, this time to 32,000 cubic feet per second, the increased flow brought forth sandstone-colored water. Pieces of concrete and rock were hurled from the spillway. Obviously, the spillway was being heavily damaged. The flow was immediately reduced and the water cleared. By this time, however, the peak of the spring runoff over 120,000 cubic feet per second was flowing into Lake Powell. Much of this inflow would have to be sent through the spillways. It was a tense situation for the engineers in charge. No one could enter the left spillway, yet no one knew the extent of the damage. Hopefully we'll be able to keep them online. Yeah, that's really large flows, and uh, they've been that way for a long time, would have to stay that way again for a long time, so you can see that it'll be very critical in that decision that we make. The only way we can get additional storage is to add flashboards on top of the gates, tie them back down into the gate struts, and that will add additional storage in the reservoir.